these are some of the hardest words that we hear Jesus speak in the book of Revelation. Um, but, but at the same time, it's, it's, it, it, at the very same time, it is some of the most compassionate and inspiring. I mean, I mean there's this word of, of rebuke, and, and yet at the very same time, there are these promises to hold on to about love and closeness and kindness and, and glory. And so um, I wanted to make sure that as we hear this last word, that we hear it in that tone of, of Jesus being for us. And even when there's hard things to say, he says it with love and compassion. And, um, and it's because he cares. He cares about our lives. He cares about what's going on. He cares about your heart. So I want to I start with a question today. And it is a question that Jesus cares about deeply. What's your dream? Or what are your dreams? What are you dreaming for? What do you long for? What future do you want to see become real? When we chase our dreams, we live. When we stop chasing our dreams, we start to die. And Jesus came to wake us up. But to wake us up into dreams and to be people who dream, the young, the old, the Holy Spirit inspiring in us, something unique in each one of us, of our hearts and our longing and our desires. Some of our dreams are going to be eclipsed by greater dreams. When I was a child, I used to dream the American dream. It was really the only dream that I knew. And so I dreamt for wealth and for a big house. And I wanted influence. I wanted power. And then I met Jesus. And um, in this passage, he opens up. And, and he says these words, and there's, and there's things that he says about himself. That he is the amen, and he is the faithful and true witness. That um, he is the way that the NIV translated is the beginning of God's creation. When I, when I first met Jesus, I did not know these words. Well, I knew amen, but I kind of thought amen was just like some period, you know, like at the end of a prayer. It's just how you were supposed to end the prayer. I had no idea what this word meant. I just knew that if you prayed, at the end of it, you were supposed to say amen. I mean, when I was, you know, I, when I was a little kid, and we didn't pray at all except at Easter. <laughs> um, and we always had ham at Easter. And so some of you have heard this. was, But, you know, ham was one of my favorite foods. And so, you know, so that's the part where all I'm waiting to do is let's get through this prayer so we can get to the good stuff because the prayer is boring. And so it was like, okay, so finally I'm right there and the ham is at the other end of the table. And so, and then it comes to the amen, but I don't say amen. I say a ham past the man. And, um, <laughs> and I messed up the period and I got in a little trouble for that, but... When I first met Jesus, I did not know the meaning of these, of these titles. But I did experience them. Um, amen is a Hebrew word. And so it's getting transliterated into Greek because it's part of just coming out of the Old Testament. This is what we say. But, but, but they knew what it meant. And, and amen is like an affirmation. Yes. But it's also like this, it's an affirmation with a sense of conviction and confidence. And so it shall be. And so when you pray and you're speaking truth to God 
and you're leaning on God's promises and you're asking for him to be faithful to who he is and then say, yes, yes, this is how it's going to be. You're so good. And in some way, you know, this is the part where Jesus is sitting there and he is this amen. And the closest thing that we have in the New Testament to kind of explaining this title is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is sitting there and he says that all of the promises of God are yes to us in Jesus Christ because he is our amen. And when I met Jesus, I experienced him as the one who promises life. And he wants to give me life. And he wants to lead me into life. And it's about more and better and yes and the promises of God. And, and I experienced him as this faithful and true witness I didn't understand it all in the beginning, but I, I, but I did know that he was showing me something of what God meant. And then I, then I came to realize that Jesus really is God becoming a human being, showing us what he meant for us human beings to become. And what he showed us was, and, and this is the witness part, right? And the word there for witness is martyr. And he showed us faithfulness. He showed us truth, and truth is genuine. Here's the real deal. Here's what humanity is supposed to be. And it is the, it is the fullness of his life, and it is the culmination of what his life did for us. Love, sacrifice, mercy, kindness, forgiveness, grace. And when I met Jesus... And I realized that he loved me and he lived for me and he died for me. And he died so that I might live forever. I started to dream a new dream. This, this last image that we get here of this picture of um, the beginning of creation. It's, a, it's an interesting Word it, it 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 has a little bit richer sense of uh, arche. It's a foundational principle, um, and um, and the idea here is is that it, it is that Jesus is the source. He's the beginning in the sense that he is the source from which all creation comes. All things were created by him and through him. And nothing that has come into being came into being apart from him. And, and he is the source of life. And he is the place to build our lives because everything that is good and true and beautiful comes from him and rests upon him and can only be sustained by him. So I didn't, I didn't know all these words but I, be, I was experiencing that with him. And some of you know this, many of you probably, because I've told this before. But, I mean, I'm a goal-oriented kind of person, and I like to dream dreams, and I like to set up goals. And so here I am, and I got my life all planned out. And then I meet Jesus, and then I'm learning the story. And, and then I have this sense of conviction Jesus sitting on the throne, speaking to me. The Lord of heaven and earth knows me. And he says, are you going to play at this thing or are you going to follow me? And I knew that the dreams that I had up to that point weren't enough. There was something more. I, I didn't want to just go after wealth and money. It's, it's too selfish. It's too simple. It's too small. And I said, I don't want to play at this thing. I want to follow you. And um, my call to ministry goes back to that day. Because at that point, just going after money made no sense. 
Just going after the American dream doesn't make any sense. I'm not living for this life. I'm living for eternity. And then I see the college minister walk about 100 yards away across the, the green grass of the field. And I hear a voice in my head. Because I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, what do I do now? I mean, i, I got to do something. And then I hear a voice that says, you could do that. And I am living my dream. I know I shared this a couple weeks ago. I didn't feel like preaching a couple weeks ago. I had wonderful support from people. Lots of you were praying for me. That's great. Um, but nobody said this was going to be easy or simple. The promise is it's going to be good. And I'm living the dream. And, and I am. I, there's nothing I'd rather do. I mean, nothing else makes sense. And we're talking about meaning and we're talking about purpose. And the wonderful news is, is that God knows you. And he knows why he made you. And he knows your purposes. And he has plans for you. And he wants you to dream. And he has a dream that's bigger than your dream, but he wants it to become your dream, but all of our small little dreams, there's parts of them that, that get lifted up into that dream because it's who you are. There's things that you're passionate about. He wants us to be people who chase dreams. He wants us to be caught up in great things, bigger than what we are, but also things that will help us become bigger and greater. What you are has not yet been revealed. You are more than you know. We have one life, so let it be great. So go after your dreams. Scott McKnight writes, at the core of every dream you have, behind every dream you have, ahead of every dream others have, and in the center of every good dream every human has, we will find the kingdom that Jesus dreams of. For Jesus, the kingdom, and Scott spends a lot of time writing about this, is that, you know, especially if you've been in the church, the, the, the kingdom is this word that we become familiar with. Jesus declared the kingdom of God. But, but most of us don't feel it. And so it kind of is this empty thing. I mean, we know we're supposed to be excited about it. We know that Jesus was excited about it, but we're not quite sure exactly what it is. And so it's not that exciting. This is the way that Scott McKnight defines it. For Jesus... The kingdom meant God's dream for this world coming true. Our God has dreams, and he has a big dream. And that dream is going to become reality. And it is his creation lifted up into glory, where his light shines all the way through it, and yet everything has its place and everything is beautiful. Let me put this forward to you. Being religious and religion is not enough for us. Being accepted into a church isn't enough. Neither is climbing the corporate ladder or solving intellectual problems or chasing the American dream. Finding a person to marry isn't enough. Sex isn't enough. Pleasure isn't enough. Friends aren't enough. Knowledge isn't enough. Politics is definitely not enough. Food and drink isn't enough. Fame isn't enough. None of this stuff is enough. And that's what Jesus was dealing with in Laodicea. The people thought... They were fine 
more than fine. They were rich. We don't need anything. We've got clothes, we've got food, we've got wealth. And because of the clothes, the food, and the wealth, life's going well, we're seeing well, we're spiritually, we've got Jesus in our corner, everything's good. They thought they were flourishing. But Jesus looks at them and he says, you're dying. They were losing the dream. They were losing their passion. And Jesus says, I'm about ready. And, and this is the only time this word occurs in the New Testament. And it, it's spit is a really bad translation. And they, they, they do this translation because the, what Jesus actually says is so harsh and they don't want to upset people with it. But what he says is, is that I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. So, two sets of questions. What's the problem? How did they get to this place where Jesus is about ready to vomit them out? And then, and then what's the solution? How are we to move forward? Um, so there's an interesting thing. This is the part, and part of getting into this, these letters of revelation. And one of the things that I've been saying is, is that you know, part of it is that, that is Jesus is shining light. And he is helping us to see not just what we can see through material things, but he's helping us to see what's going on on the inside. And, 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 and so he's giving us light so that we might see more of the spiritual realities of what are play. On the outside, everything looks good. They're wealthy. They're secure. But on the inside, things are falling apart. And, and what stands out is, is that as Jesus speaks into their situation, we've, we've, we've done some hard work over the centuries, but especially in the last couple hundred years, of really digging down and going, what was going on in these cities? And what's been amazing is that Jesus was speaking into that situation. He knew exactly what was going on. Um, and the thing is, is that as Jesus speaks into their situation and, he, and, and he's saying, well, you guys are sitting there saying, I have no need. What, what we know is, is that that phrase that they were saying, I have no need, is exactly what their culture trained them to say in Laodicea. And so they sound like the surrounding culture. Because Laodicea was one of the, if not the wealthiest city of Asia Minor, when um, the volcano blew and there was a great earthquake, that cities were, were taken down to rubble, and so the empire stepped in and offered money and stuff to help. And, and Laodicea said, we don't need anything. And that, and that was actually became an inscription, and it became a catchphrase for, this, for the city, Um, you sit there and you think everything's going well because, well, you, you have nice clothes. Well, it ends up that Laodicea was famous for their clothes. They had these sheep that were black, and they had some of the best wool in the Roman Empire, and, um, and everybody was finely dressed. And, and, and your dress said you're successful. I mean, it was a big thing in the Roman Empire about clothes and, and, so, and the people there. So they, they sound like the surrounding culture. They look like the surrounding culture. They, they act like the surrounding culture. The pride of the city was in part their clothes, and they took pride in that. Part of the pride of the city was um, their school of medicine. And there is some evidence that there was um, 
a, a special chemical that they made that w was used to make um, treatments for people for eyes, and they would rub it on their eyes. We see much better. They boast like the surrounding culture. What is that saying? If it walks like a duck, swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must. So one of the problems for them is cultural compromise. They are in the world and they are of the world and you can't tell any difference from them than the surrounding culture. It's hard. The culture wants to squeeze us into its form. But we are to be a community that looks different, acts different, speaks different, values things differently. And Laodicea is so much like American culture. We don't need anything. We'll pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We'll be independent. We'll conquer it, seize it. We, and and the challenge for us, for us, is to be in the world but not of the world. But how much is the world influencing us? I mean, one of the things that, you know, that, that, that I worry about for us is just the amount of time that culture has to influence us versus how we can influence one another through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. How many hours and hours and hours are other things filling us up instead of God's Spirit and the people of God praying for one another, calling to one another, speaking words to one another. Now, part of the problem was cultural compromise. They look just like the world. But I, but I want to put to you that... Um, now, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. So, their actions. Jesus says, literally, I know your works... And they're neither hot nor cold. Um, so, Laodicea was in the Lycus Valley. And um, it was a valley of three cities. So, it was, it was its own tri-cities. There, 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 there were two cities, Heropolis and um, Colossae, that were on one side of the river... And then, and then there was Laodicea, which was on another side of the river, and which, um, and which was at a crossroads of travel and commerce, and which was one of the reasons why it was a wealthy city, and it had all these banks. Um, in, in Heropolis, they had hot springs, and, and they were famous. And people would travel, and, and, they were, and, they, and there was a healing quality. People would go to the hot springs, and they would, they would go in, and they would soak in them, and it would help with aches and pains and other things. And so people came there for that. In Colossae, they had fresh, cool water, which was excellent for drinking. But in Laodicea, they neither had hot water nor cold water. They had water that was good for nothing. It was tepid. In fact, one of the things that would happen is people would drink the water and they would get sick and they would vomit it out. So for a long time, people have, and, and, and there's been lots of sermons that have preached this, that you know, people would say, well, the hot is about people being on fire for Jesus. And then, then other people would sit there and say, and being cold was being far from Jesus, but at least you know you were cold. And being lukewarm was being neither hot nor cold. It was just kind of, that's not what this is about. I know your works. And they are utterly and completely ineffective. I, I wished you could be hot and you could bring healing to people. I wish you could be cold and help refresh their souls. But neither being hot nor cold, you are good for nothing. And I'm about to vomit you out. Now, 
one of the things we've talked about in this series is that we're going to choose being over doing first. And, and, and it's about who we're becoming. But, but there is a place for doing. We are supposed to share in the mission of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to love him so much that, of course, we're going to follow him and serve him and do what he calls us to do. And, and this takes us to the second part. Their works were a problem. Their, their values were a problem. They were culturally compromised. And because of all of this, they were good for nothing. No light was shining through them. Nobody could tell there was a difference. But behind all of the cultural compromise, I think that there is something deeper going on. And it has to do with the fundamental stance of their self-sufficiency. And that Jesus is on the outside of their lives. And it ends up being relational. And it ends up being Jesus-focused. Um, this is not written to non-believers. Sometimes this passage gets used in evangelistic circumstances and it's a wonderful picture. And it is true that Jesus wants to see unbelievers and he's knocking on the door of their hearts and he wants them to open up to him for the first time. But this message is not to unbelievers. It's to a church that has Jesus on the outside. And that's the problem. What sort of life are we supposed to be living? Is it a life of self-sufficiency where it's me and what I do and how I do it and all of that stuff? No! It is a life with Jesus and it's learning Christ's sufficiency, his power, his strength, his spirit inside me and you. I have no need. And Jesus comes and says, okay, let me help you guys out a little bit. Listen to my counsel. Take my words. Let me give to you so that you can buy from me gold that's been refined in the fire. Come and get from me garments, not of black, but of white, Garments that only I can give that will identify you as the people of God. Um, the problem of lukewarmness is excluding Jesus from our lives. It is as simple and tragic as that. Jesus is on the outside and he wants to come in. And this is the part where... In, but can we bring that picture up of Holman Hunt? Jesus, light of the world. I know, it, especially if you're sitting in the back, it'll be hard to see. But um, Jesus is knocking on the door. And there's no handle on the door. The handle is only on the inside. Because you and I, we have to open up and let him in. And, and, and... And that was the thing that for a year, I would look at this picture and I would see that. And I would think about the gentleness of Jesus and the graciousness of Jesus. So, what's the solution? It's to answer his call. It is to live a life where we invite him in and we share life together. Now, it's altogether possible that some of you are, have never opened the door, that you are still wouldn't identify as a Christian. And maybe you're here because you know that you're looking. And maybe you feel like something's missing. Jesus says... Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those who know that they are poor and pitiful and that they need some help and that their life isn't working and that, and that they want help. Because Jesus wants to come into your life. And Jesus says, you're blessed. All you got to do is open the door. Let him in. 
You may have opened the door some time ago and you let them in, but then you got so busy you pushed them out. And for whatever reason, you are excluding Jesus from your life. And I want you to hear the good news. He's standing at the door right now and he's knocking. He is patient and kind and merciful. One of the interesting things to know, and this is, you know, I I talked about this earlier, that when we hear the words of rebuke, it's important that we hear them in the right tone. And I want you to hear them with compassion and love. Jesus wants to come in. He wants to be with you. And he knows your situation and he knows your condition. And there's an interesting thing that goes on in Greek. All these words, pitiful, poor, wretched, naked, They all end with the same two letters, os, O-S. And that is the language in Greek of compassion. And as Jesus is speaking these words, here's your condition. He feels your pain and your suffering, and he wants to help. He says, I want to be with you. That's why you stop dreaming. That's why you feel cold and empty. That's why there is no peace and no hope. And so welcome him back in. Jesus is calling. This is the life. Not going and doing a bunch of things by ourselves and then telling Jesus about it. That's a life of self-sufficiency. It is a life now where every moment and everything and all the things that we do, we share with Jesus. He wants to be with you. Now... It's altogether possible that many of us have opened the door to Jesus and, he, and we've let him in. But we've only let him in some of the way into our life. That he came in the front door and he's kind of in the entryway. But inside our house there are a whole bunch of shut doors where we exclude Jesus. But Jesus says, I want to be the Lord and Savior of every part of your life. I want all of you. And he wants us to open the door to every room of our hearts. He's not going to force himself in. He is gentle and kind, humble and patient. But he is knocking and he is persistent. Some of you need to let him into the office. Let him be the amen and foundation of all the work that you do and let him into your workplace where you work and guide you in what you do. Some of us need to let him into our families and and how we are with our families so that there's all these things of the pressures that our family will put on us, but what we need to do is what Jesus calls us to do. Some of us need to let him into our bedroom and say, okay, you're going to be the Lord of my sexuality. Some of us need to let him have control over the safe where we keep our money. And some of us need to let him into our past where we finally share our trauma and our pain and our fears and our wounds. Some of us need to let him into our emotions And we all of us need to let him into our dreams so that he can show us our deepest dreams. Jesus says, look, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. And what I'm telling you is is answer that call. Open that door. Let Jesus lead you. Let him come in. Let him share life with you. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and your way and your will. And I thank you, Lord, your desire to bless us and keep us. May we respond to your call in Jesus' name. Amen.